Latino Americans have become an important voting bloc in the United States. A voice for Hispanic American rights speaks out about the issues they face and how they could affect the presidential election. I'm Elaine Reyes in Washington, D.C., and this is America's Now. First up, with the U.S. presidential election days away, who will Hispanic Americans vote for? A lot of your memories. Correspondent Mike school. Kirsch talks to an influential labor leader who's been defending Hispanic rights since the 1960s. Next, a woman with a genetic disorder who became a self-taught fashion designer. She creates clothes for kids with Down syndrome whose bodies don't fit into traditional sizes. From Guatemala, meet this week's guest, Isabella Springmule. And later, the ruins in Machu Picchu are one of the America's most remarkable historic sites and Peru's top tourist attraction. They're also a striking symbol of the long-lost Inca Empire. We have 14,000 years of history that is not recorded by in writing, but is recorded in our DNA. One can't help but be impressed. Correspondent Dan Collins reports on an investigation to identify royal descendants from the ancient Inca civilization. Welcome to the show. With all eyes on the U.S. presidential election, some say the influential vote of Hispanic Americans may very well decide the next president. The group now makes up nearly 20 percent of the United States population. Correspondent Mike Kirsch talked to Hispanic American labor leader and civil rights champion Dolores Huerta. She's been fighting racism and discrimination against Hispanics in the U.S., going back to farm worker strikes in the 1960s with her late colleague, Cesar Chavez. This is his report. Central Valley has been called the Golden Empire for its riches of agriculture and oil. Where human rights groups claim Mexican migrants and other Hispanics who make up a majority of the population here in most communities continue to be treated unfairly in terms of their wages, human rights, and their legal rights by the establishment here. From farm owners who profit handsomely each year from the $50 billion a year agriculture business here of America, it's fruit and vegetables. To the oil executives here, they say, who are profiting enormously from billions of dollars in sales of crude oil pumped out of the ground here each year. All told, of the nearly 7 million people who reside here in California's Central Valley, more than half are said to be Hispanic or other persons of color. And Hispanics have emerged as a powerful and motivated voting bloc in the national elections. Motivated in recent years, they say, by increasing cases of excessive and deadly force by police against Hispanics. In addition to what they say is increasing hostility they're facing from white residents in California. Why are you here? So if there is a place in America to gauge how Hispanics will likely vote in the upcoming U.S. presidential election, it's California's Central Valley. CCTV recently arrived in one of the valley's biggest cities, Bakersfield, California, about 100 miles north of Los Angeles, to meet one of America's most respected voices in the Hispanic community. Dolores Huerta, who at the age of 86 is considered one of America's greatest living icons from the country's civil rights struggles in the 1960s. You cannot pretend that we do not exist. Huerta's place in history cemented in the late 60s when she organized an international boycott of grapes that forced wealthy grape growers here in California's Central Valley to give Hispanic farm workers better pay and provide them basic human necessities such as drinking water and portable restrooms. At a time when Puerta was raising seven children of her own, she led labor strikes in which farm workers were often beaten by police. Puerta was the co-founder of the United Farm Workers Union with her colleague, the late labor leader giant Cesar Chavez, both demanding equality for all Hispanics in America and for their rightful place in this country. For a place under the sun. 
And when it comes to the influence of the Hispanic vote in U.S. presidential elections, Puerta and Chavez showed for the first time just how influential the Hispanic vote is during the 1968 presidential race. When they registered 200,000 first-time Hispanic voters in the state of California, whose votes for U.S. Senator Robert F. Kennedy in the state's Democratic primary were directly responsible for his victory. Kennedy's seen here thanking Huerta at his side. And Dolores Huerta, who is an old friend of mine and has worked with the union, to thank her. And... Moments later, Huerta watched in horror as Kennedy was assassinated. Senator Kennedy has been shot if possible. Oh, my God. Huerta has outlived most of her peers from the era, including her friend and colleague Cesar Chavez, who died at 66 after a heart attack in 1993. I would imagine a lot of your memories are what fuel your fire, your inspiration today. We've got to think about the, all of the work that we have ahead of us. Huerta has kept going, saying that the hard-fought victories for Hispanic rights and dignity over the years sometimes seem long forgotten and dismissed today. For example, during speeches made, she says, by the likes of Republican U.S. presidential candidate Donald Trump, who some say has made little attempt to sugarcoat his opinion of some Mexican immigrants. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. Trump's been widely criticized for this, and as well for threatening to deport 12 million undocumented Hispanic immigrants from the United States, and for his calls to finish building the iron wall spanning much of the U.S.-Mexico border. Trump's opinion of Mexicans and other Hispanic immigrants, Huerta says, would trouble Cesar Chavez if he were alive today. I often reflect on uh, Cesar and uh, what would Caesar say or what would Caesar do in a situation like this. She and says Chavez would continue demanding that Hispanics and all people be treated equally, as Huerta has been doing ever since, recently winning the Presidential Medal of Freedom for her life's work and for her nonprofit organization, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, fighting what Huerta says remains often wide open racism and discrimination against Hispanics across the country with some of the worst cases, ironically, right here, where Huerta, decades ago, won her farm labor battles in California's Central Valley. Here in the county of Kern, where mostly white men, she says, remain in charge of government and law enforcement. Well, this is one of the poorest congressional districts in the United States of America. I think we're the third poorest in the whole country. And yet, uh, we have a lot of wealth, because this is agriculture, uh, they make billions of dollars, both agriculture and uh, the oil industry. And yet we have people that are very, very poor. Their average wage is probably something like $15,000 a year. So it, it's very unjust, uh, the system that we have here. One recent example of discrimination here, says Huerta, are the number of Hispanic students who were kicked out of high schools here in Kern County in 2011. More than 2,500 high school students were expelled or suspended the majority of them Hispanics and African Americans. 2,500 students in all. That's more than all the students kicked out of high school in Los Angeles County, just 100 miles south of here. That has 10 times more high school students than in Kern County. When CCTV asked officials at the Kern High School District why students are expelled, they said expulsions are considered justified for a range of offenses, from bringing a gun to school, to selling drugs, to stealing. Though Dolores Huerta's foundation and other civil rights groups claim that some Hispanic students were expelled for minor offenses, such as simply talking back to teachers. She says the many expulsions here have often landed many young Hispanics and blacks with nothing to do, no school, behind bars in prison, becoming victims of what's referred to as the school-to-prison pipeline policies of many schools across the United States, like here in Kern County, says Huerta, that adversely impact primarily students of color. And I feel like that's wrong because... Sylvia Gomez is a high school freshman who says she sometimes fears whatever she might say to a teacher could get her expelled from school. It makes me feel anger, but it also makes me feel like I'm discriminated against just for my race, just for my color of skin. Well, we have so many young people that are in prison that shouldn't be in prison. They shouldn't be in prison, you know. And again, that goes back to our educational system. I know exactly what these kids are going through. I've been through every stage of it. Mexican and Native American Joey Williams says it was a visit here to the Kern County Courthouse and jail 20 years ago for drunken disorderly when he says he was severely beaten by a group of white police officers. And am I going to get killed 
here in this county jail. That he says would inspire him to become a community organizer, speaking out against the mass incarceration of young Hispanics and blacks, and to criticize the more than 50 fatal shootings and beatings of people by police here in the last decade, many of the victims Hispanics. One of the most egregious cases, the police beating of David Silva, a father of three, here in 2013. In fact, a memorial remains here where it happened at the corner of Palm and Flower Street in Bakersfield. Many citizens here still condemning what they refer to as Silva's murder police. <laughs> Silva had been found intoxicated and passed out here at the corner and was then subsequently beaten by nine police officers who also attacked Silva with a police dog. Witnesses in this apartment building videotaped the beating, one of them calling in the incident to the emergency police hotline 911. Your police officers beat the out of him and killed him. Well, I have it all on video camera. Despite beating Silva repeatedly, the police claimed they used no excessive force. The Kern County ruled that Silva died by asphyxiation. Silva's family eventually was awarded a $3.4 million settlement in a wrongful death lawsuit against the police. Local law enforcement officials declined CCTV's request for comment. So what we have here is the seat of justice, or sometimes we can call it the seat of injustice here in Kern. This is where a lot of our people uh, uh, end up here down below where I was at, where you are uh, being judged by 12 jurors who are necessarily your they don't look like you, and you got judges who are elected by people who uh, vote all the time in every election who are not Latino, not Hispanic. I sat in a meeting yesterday with school administrators and uh, from different districts here, and none of them were people of color. We're not reflecting our population. We give a look at our board of supervisors. We have five males who are Republican, and we have one Democratic Latina. You can see that the system is set up against us. Williams says decades of racial discrimination against Hispanics will lead to what he believes will be a massive voter turnout in the upcoming U.S. election. The waking of the sleeping giant. There is a big backlash from the Latino community where uh, Spanish stations are, you know, uh, depicting Donald Trump in a negative light, you know, talking uh, negatively about Donald Trump because of the policies that he's advocating from his campaign platform. Dolores Huerta believes the majority of voting age Hispanics, not just here in California, but across the country, will most likely not vote for someone like Donald yeah, Trump. I think I'll win the Hispanic vote. Even when Trump has campaigned as one who has provided Hispanic Americans thousands of jobs over the years. And there have been large numbers of Hispanics showing up in support of Trump at his rallies. For conservative Hispanics, going back to support for Republican U.S. President Richard Nixon, is the Republican National Hispanic Assembly. Its chairman, Gonzalo Ferrer, tells CCTV that while it's difficult to determine how many conservative Hispanic Americans will vote for Donald Trump in the end, what is clear, he says, is that more than just a few of the 27 million Hispanics registered to vote in America will not be voting for a Democrat, he says, like Hillary Clinton. Particularly, he says, considering the record number of undocumented Hispanic immigrants deported by outgoing Democrat President Barack Obama. Obama has been the person who has deported most Hispanics than any other prior president in the U.S. And a lot of our relatives and cousins have been deported from the USA by the Obama administration. The, the party is supposed to be the party of the people, the party of the Hispanics, which actually is not. That Hispanics may not often be treated with equality by either party in the U.S. is something even Dolores Huerta will concede that America still has work to do in that regard. And we're not going to change this in our society. It's got to start with our educational system. How many people know that the White House and the Congress were built by African slaves? That is not taught in our school books, okay? Children are not racist. They're not born racist. They are taught that by their parents. And in order to end that uh, cancer of racism that we have in our society, we've got to, you know, teach our children what the what the contributions of the immigrant community have been to this country. The immigrant communities, um, you know, not only from Mexico and Asia, the Philippines and Chinese, Japanese, you know, uh, African slaves that were brought here, 
but also people of Europe, you know, the Irish, the Italians, and the Slavs, all these people that came here that built this country. Quite that careful to remember Native Americans. Not only did we take their land, but we enslaved them also. They were the first slaves, the Native Americans, and we have never really had any kind of retribution for them, uh, never any kind of reparations for them. If we don't do this, Anglo children will all, always feel entitled and somehow they're the ones that they're their people are the ones uh, that built the country, and it's not, it's not so. Huerta says she won't predict which candidate the average Hispanic will vote for in the end, but she says she knows who she's supporting. Well, I'm supporting Hillary Clinton. Huerta believes the same spirit of hope that drove so many young people of color to elect Barack Obama, the first African-American president of the United States, will ring true for what she hopes will be America's first woman as president. Our younger people they're so much more uh, informed. Uh, they're not racist. They're not homophobic. They're not sexist. So I think we do have uh, a hope for the country, and uh, we will. I think that will play out in, in the elections. What may play out in this presidential election is that many Hispanics, Democrats, or Republicans, all Hispanics who vote, who say they've become disenchanted with the democratic process, will be watching more closely than ever before. The president represents their interests, particularly on issues such as deportation and immigration reform. Because no party today is reflecting or including the Hispanic population at the level where we feel we need to be included. This presidential election, they say, and how Hispanics are included in the American way going forward could be an important factor for the outcome of future elections. During the 2012 election, the Latino vote made up 10% of the electorate. At the time, the Latino population registered to vote was growing by one point every presidential cycle, according to a Pew Research Center report. Coming up. An interview with the president of the CAF Development Bank of Latin America. We are the banker who brings the umbrella when it's raining, because in sunny days, you do not need an umbrella. What do I mean by that? We have never stopped supporting countries in difficult times. America's Now. Welcome back to America's Now. Earlier, this, the Chinese-led Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, or AIIB, held its very first meetings with its 57 founding members. By the end of 2016, that number could almost double with dozens of countries waiting to join. Other development banks like the IMF, World Bank, and IDB have been around for decades, making headlines with its predictions and projects. The CAF Development Bank is different. It's owned by a majority of Latin American countries and led by the same man for the last quarter century. We recently sat down with CAF President Enrique Garcia, who has seen the region's economic landscape change dramatically during his tenure. President Garcia, thank you so much for joining us on America's Now. Well, very pleased to be here, enjoying this, this conference. You have been head of the CAF Bank for 25 years now. What are some of the biggest changes that you've seen in the region since you arrived? Well, let me tell you, in a very interesting period, I started in 1991. I was elected there in the five-year periods and then re-elected, and now will be 25 years. And in that period, many things have changed in Latin America, in the world, and in CAF. And I, let me tell you that at that time, we were going out of the so-called lost decade in Latin America because in the, the, the early 80s, we had a very hectic situation in Latin America. We had a hyperinflation, and the debt crisis, and it forced Latin America to adjust itself and to have a recession with unemployment and so forth. So the 90s was a renaissance, let's say, and we started in the region to move with more optimism to try to restore growth and to make changes in the way the economy worked. And in that context, I became president of CAF, and I thought that CAF 
had a great potential because it was created with, with very innovative uh, with approach that was taken by the, those who wrote the, the basic uh, bylaws of the, of the institution. And it was a small institution. It was five countries. It was Andean, from, from the Andean community. And the level of operations was about approvals of about $400 million. So what we did is to, to try to project a different model of, of institution, in the sense that traditional multilaterals, uh, like the World Bank, the IDB, the African Development Bank, they have two types of members, donor countries and recipient countries. And donor countries are industrialized countries, basically the United States, Japan, UK, so forth. They put money. And, but they don't receive the benefits of the loans and the technical cooperation. And the developing countries put some money too, but they are the ones who receive the, the, the support. Well, I didn't want to repeat that. So let's try to have an institution that is owned by emerging countries. So you talk about emerging countries, the Latin American countries. Do you think that's what makes your bank so special, the, the relationships in the region, what really sets it apart from the IDB, from the IMF? Well, I tell you, the type of ownership makes the difference. And we are, in fact, in fact, that's very interesting, we are the only regional multilateral in the world that has that model. And the difference is very simple because everybody is committed to the institution. We are the banker who brings the umbrella when it's raining. Because in sunny days, you do not need an umbrella. What do I mean by that? We have never stopped supporting countries in difficult times. By the same token, no country has been, you know, not paying their dues, capital increases. There is a sense of ownership, of commitment. Another thing is very interesting. There is no political interference because we are very independent. We respect different ideologies. We don't interfere with the governments in terms of how they want it. Some are very market-oriented, others are state-oriented. We respect the differences. The only thing we request is that the initiatives that we are going to support are well done. They have good feasibility studies. They take into account technical, economic, financial, environmental issues, social issues and there is transparency, and that's it. What is your assessment of the region right now economically, and where do you see the future of well, your bank? Well, let me tell you, I think we, we have had a very successful early part of this millennium, uh, thanks to two things. The first one is that we learned from the, the lessons from the errors, mistakes we did in the 80s in macroeconomic management. So most countries of the region have very good management of the, the economy and, and that's independent of ideology. Second, we were lucky. Lucky because the dynamic behavior of China and Asia, commodity prices went up. And that has been a very important thing for the, the region. The consequence has been that the region has had a reasonable growth, about 5 to 5% five, five, uh, a reduction of poverty, substantial. Now, things have changed in the last two years. And, of course, the, the growth uh, rate of Latin America has gone down from that 4 or 5 to levels. Uh, if you exclude the two cases in which we have difficulties now, and that is, uh, Venezuela and Brazil, growth is, instead of being 4 or 5, it's in the other country about two, five, four, two, three. Uh, the, the hope is that in the next years we'll restore growth. And we have to move to, again, to rates of growth of four to five percent. But that's easy to say, but difficult to do. So my question, your question can be answered with one word, a point of inflection. We have to transit from a traditional model of comparative advantage in which commodities are the fundamental engine of growth with no value added to competitive advantage, which means that we have to give value added, we have to improve the quality of infrastructure, the quality of, of technology, the quality of human resources, and try to attract 
direct foreign investment, they will be also directed to change of production and trade in the world. President Garcia, thank you so much for well, your It's a pleasure indeed. Thank you very much. Coming up. Design clothes that fit kids with Down syndrome. I incorporated the exact measurements into my designs so that the kids can get clothes that fit them. America's Next. Welcome back. People born with Down syndrome often face physical and mental challenges. They are underestimated and discriminated against. But many lead happy and productive lives. One young woman with Down syndrome in Guatemala is breaking stereotypes in the fickle and cutthroat fashion world by opening up new opportunities to others living. Isabella Springmule is this week's Game Changer. Hola, soy Isabela Espíritu Tejada, tengo 19 años, tengo síndrome de Down, soy diseñadora de modas. Y mi sueño es que yo quiero llegar es tener mi propio boutique, mi propio atelier y que mi, que mi equipo sea emocionalmente famoso. Mira, tengo una línea de ropa llamado Down to Chavel. Lo que yo hago es que estos son diseños para todo el mundo, pero especial los chicos como yo, con, con síndrome de Down. A ellos son difíciles conseguir la ropa, como camisas y pantalones, unos largos, otros pequeños, otros cortos, porque no sabemos cómo va a ser nuestro cuerpo. Y yo pensé tener ya sus medidas exactas para que los chicos y chicas con síndrome de Down con sus medidas puedan tener la ropa que yo hago. Es por eso que esto se llama Down to Shave. En Guatemala lo que hago es, bueno, buscando telas típicas inspirado por Guatemala porque es nuestro Traje nacional de Guatemala, y eso pro proviene y viene de la moda que hago. Las muñecas que ven, mis sacos, mis jalecos, por la Guatemala que me inspira, porque lo llama y porque es la emoción que hay. Isabela es una chica extraordinaria, como cualquiera, como cualquiera de mis hijos, eh, estudió en un colegio regular, ella ha sido parte de la familia y ha sido incluida y es parte de todos y eso es lo que estos chicos necesitan, ser parte de nuestra sociedad. Isabela, desde pequeñita, tenía muy claro lo que ella quería hacer. Ella, desde pequeñita, tomaba hojas de papel, las ponía sobre las revistas y trazaba a las, los, las figuras humanas y hacía sus vestidos. Más tarde, sus muñecas de trapo, ella me pedía telas, pedacetazos de tela y ella con alfiler le hacía la ropa a sus muñecas de trapo. Isabela se ha convertido en una diseñadora completa, autodidacta, porque ella recibe clases de, de corte y confección, está recibiendo clases de patronaje, recibe computación por, uh, para hacer diseño de modas, sin embargo ella no ha tenido una, una educación universitaria. 
ella diseña como ella dice con el corazón y así lo es Todos, todo lo que ella hace está cargado de color es una enamorada de nuestros textiles y nuestros tejidos y Guatemala es tan rica en, 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 en esto realmente las, las mujeres, nuestras, nuestras mujeres, nuestras indígenas, nuestras tejedoras han transmitido de generación en generación la historia de Guatemala a través de los tejidos. Mi nombre es Doña Petronila Méndez, yo vengo de Santa María de Jesús, de aquí de Zacatepec. Y yo vengo aquí, la visita con Isabela es a venir a vender los cortes, los huipiles, las fajas, todo lo que es tela. Y estos son los castes, ¿eh? Qué lindo. Ajá. En cambio, sí, porque usted sabe que todo nos cuesta, este todos los productos. Isabela es una chica muy especial, es una niña muy, muy respetuosa. Ella valora las cosas típicas, porque nadie puede valorar lo que, lo que nosotros hacemos. Pero ella valoró mucho. Esta es una señadora de que nadie lo puede saber hacer. Por eso nosotros nos extrañamos de que el trabajo muy bonito. Como los huipiles, que ella desarma los huipiles y hacen los cuellos. ¿Cómo lo hace ella? A ver, busca, busca manera cómo lo hace ella. Nos manda por WhatsApp ya, hecho. Bien. Es una niña muy hermosa y muy valorosa. Entonces nosotros a ella le agradecemos mucho que ella nos ayuda, porque ahorita en el tiempo que estamos no hay mucha venta y ella nos ayuda bastante, le agradecemos mucho. Ah, que es lindo, tiene cupones, esto es un Isabela me ha demostrado que para ella no hay nada que no se pueda hacer. A lo largo de sus 19 años todo lo ha hecho, todo le ha costado el doble, pero ella lo ha conseguido. Esa tenacidad que ella tiene es admirable. Y eso son todas las personas con síndrome Down. La sociedad debe conocer lo maravilloso que estos chicos aportan a nuestras vidas, lo maravilloso que ellos aportan a la sociedad. Lo que yo quiero es que la gente mire los chicos posiblemente de Down podemos hacer con todo de su corazón amor que tenemos a toda la gente que nos rodea, de los seres queridos. Y yo, eso me inspiré para que la gente que nos luchen, que no se rindan, que no se venzan. Yo quiero que esa gente tenga una meta y que puedan cumplir como yo. Isabella's works have gone beyond London Fashion Week. They've also been showcased in several Latin American countries. We'd love to have your input, so if you know someone who's had the world, drop us a line at an at cctv-america.com or tweet us at cctv underscore America and tell us about a game changer you would like to see on America's Now. Coming up. A genetic investigation into the royal bloodlines of the Inca Empire. We have 14,000 years of history that is not recorded by in writing, but is recorded in our DNA. America's Now. Welcome back to America's Now. At the time, the Inca Empire was the largest in the New World. It extended from its center in modern-day Peru, with Colombia to the north and parts of Chile and Argentina to the south. But the ancient empire fell to Spanish conquerors nearly 500 years ago. What remains is their magnificent architecture, and today it is one of Peru's greatest tourist attractions. Until now, there was little verifiable trace of the descendants of Inca nobility, even in Cusco, the one-time capital of the empire. Correspondent Dan Collins takes us there. Una vista. 
Everyone who visits Peru has heard of the Incas. No tourist can ignore their legacy. It's the country's principal attraction. The Inca citadel of Machu Picchu is visited by around a million tourists every year. Almost all of those visitors pass through Cusco, the one-time capital of the Inca's impressive empire, where their walls still stand. The finely sculpted stones fit together like the pieces of a puzzle. And overlooking the city, the fort of Sacsayhuaman. Visiting Cusco, one can't help but be impressed by the beauty and monumental scale of Inca architecture. Inevitably, one asks oneself the question, what happened to that civilization which built these structures and the kings who commanded them to be built? Greedy for gold and power, the Spanish invaders vanquished this advanced civilization. The Catholic Church replaced the ancestor worship of mummies with its saints, and the conquistadors killed or banished its leaders. But the descendants of those kings live on. Alfredo Inca Roca claims he can trace his lineage back nearly 500 years to the Inca nobility. In principio debo manifestarte de que mi originalidad, mi descendencia está acreditada con documentos. Y tengo genealogía hecha hasta 1560. Solamente faltaría uh, 17 años para completar la llegada de los españoles al Cusco, eh, que fue en 1543. It's a heritage which he claims was recognized in 1545 by the Holy Roman Emperor Carlos V, who was also the King of Spain. The king wrote this lengthy missive, granting royal status to Inca Roca. Carlos V, says, yo no os mandé a matar reyes, sino a servir reyes, reyes, no. Entonces es una cosa bonita. Y pero igual avasallaron, pues no no hubo mucho. Along with the Pachacutics, the Maitacapacs, and other royal families, the Inca Rocas were turned out of Cusco's historic center. This place, now the Catholic Archbishop's Palace, was once his family home, Inca Roca Games. The noble Inca families were relocated and given land nearby in San Sebastián. Inca Roca and his family have been here ever since. He was even the local mayor. Nunca hemos tenido vergüenza. ¿Por qué? Si somos más bien privilegiados, entonces debemos andar con la cabeza levantada, ¿no? Somos gente privilegiada porque per somos descendientes de una cultura que ha sido grande en, en la antigüedad. As a younger man, Inca Roca played the role of an Inca lord in a reenactment of the Inti Raimi Sun Festival marking winter solstice. Call it Inca pride, it's infectious in San Sebastián, says its current mayor and Marcicus. La gran familia Inca se ha regocijado tanto en el distrito de San Sebastián como en el distrito de San Jerónimo. O sea, como quien dice, se han replegado acá. Todavía conservó esa mística de no mezclarse con otras personas. Por eso que fácilmente no ingresó el apellido castellano acá. Por eso que decimos que San Sebastián se ha convertido en la cuna de la incanidad. But that sentiment is not nationwide, says Dutch historian Ronald Elwood, who has painstakingly traced the bloodlines of the royal Incas to the present day. These were a little bit more the surnames of the servants, which in the end were of the original rulers. So that is symbolically, of course, quite something that you go from ruler to being servant, and that's the, the way people know about surnames like this. Well, first... After years of research, poring over parish and notary's records dating back centuries, Elwood tracked down several descendants whose lives have no royal trappings. Roberta Waman Remanchi Tupahuacayo inherits the royal blood from her mother. While many chose to improve their social status by having a Spanish surname, she refused to change. 
despite being teased at school. Muy orgullosa. Yo no tengo vergüenza de mi apellido, aunque siempre en otros lugares a veces se ríen porque es tan difícil de pronunciarlo, ¿no? Es tan difícil, pero no, yo me siento feliz, orgullosa de ser sebastiana, de ser cusqueña y tengo familiares que están tan lejos, que han progresado, son profesionales con el apellido. Y feliz, muy feliz. And her ancestors' customs of keeping the dearly departed close to home are kept alive by her 79-year-old father, Mariano. Here are the skulls of his mother, brother and grandmother. Customs run deep and the Incas left their mark like no other civilization in this part of the Americas. But DNA research shows only a handful of people can actually claim royal Inca descent. Peruvian geneticist Ricardo Fujita has found DNA correlations between some, but not all, of the families who claim Inca ancestry. Those who say they can trace their bloodline back to Huayna Capac, the last Inca. We were selecting the people that we thought that were directly linked to Huayna Capac by for the patrilineal uh, line. No, the patrilineal way means the father of the father of the father and, and so on. Backed by the National Geographic's Genographic Project, the investigation lacks one crucial DNA source. An Inca mummy explains. The problem is that the Spanish uh, burn and disappear all the Incas remains from Huayna Capac and their sons uh, and daughters too. So that's because uh, they didn't want these people, uh, uh, at the time they, they were worshipped. No? Uh, so, uh, and Spanish, they were uh, imposing the Catholic uh, uh, religion, they tried to disappear all remains of the Incas, because they were sacred. Nonetheless, based on Elwood's groundbreaking research, Fujita has traced two groups descended from the 11 original Inca clans. He and his team are reconstructing part of Peru's history, he says. The official history, it comes when the Europeans arrived here, so here in, in Peru in, in 1532. But before that, we have 14,000 years of history that is not recorded by in writing, that is recorded in our DNA. So that's why we are reconstructing the history of people that does, doesn't have history. Not only the Incas, but we have uh, reconstructing people from all over Peru, from the coast, from the Andes, from the Amazon. Back in Cusco, archaeologists are uncovering the homes and graves of the everyday people who were part of this empire. Amelia Perez is the chief archaeologist at Cotacayi. Cotacayi is a poblado of the common people, of the people who put their hands on their work to go to work at the historic center, to go to teach at the historic center. Because this people who is having is of all types, not only of all regions, but of all different regions, but also we have canteros, we have ceramists, people who worked in textiles, we have people who did jewels, so there is a mixture of people who are living here. The archaeologists have discovered ceramics from other cultures. Chumu from Peru's arid north, Nazca from the coast, and even depictions of animals from the jungle. Cusco was a melting pot for all the empire's subjects. What's remarkable about this find is it shows perhaps the true fragility of the Inca Empire. These relics show that the workers here came from cultures all across the empire's territory, and some of them may have been all too willing to swap sides with the arrival of the Spanish conquest. With initial structures dating from two to 40 years later, this site and its incredible yield of material charts the cultural transformation that came with the bloody transition to Spanish leadership. The more that's discovered, the more it's clear the Inca legacy included all Peru's cultures and peoples. Antes de me siento muy orgullosa, me siento heredera y creo que en estos sitios nosotros lo que hacemos es eh, aspirar todo ese esfuerzo que ellos han tenido, aspirar como ellos pensaban. Hace que nosotros también un poco meditemos 
y en cierto modo cambiemos algunas cosas que, que vamos haciendo en base al, al esfuerzo que ellos han hecho. Being descended from Inca royalty is a particular distinction, but knowing your roots, whatever they may be, helps Peruvians identify more with their past. In a nation divided by class and race, it's important, says Elwood. If these families could help in some way or another to strengthen a bit this element of national identity, because nobility has no meaning as such anymore because it's a republic. 200 years has passed since the colonial times, almost 500 since the conquest. But still, the country um, has very clear distinctions between different groups. And it's always good, I think, for a national to have this link with the past. Peru's spectacular Inca architecture draws millions of visitors from around the world. What's now clear is that while the Royal Incas oversaw the construction, they must share the legacy with common people from all over Peru who played a part in these wonders of the ancient world. What began with a Dutch historian's curiosity has morphed into a full-blown genetic investigation into who can really trace their blood back to the Inca rulers. So far, the findings are being kept secret, but scientists say the full results will likely be made public next year. Coming up. An icon of the art world presents women of our time. They stand on their own. They're as, in, they're as interesting as almost the subject uh, that, they're, that they're going off to do. And at some point, you see them cross over into the empathy of what the situation is. These women are extraordinary. America's Now. Welcome back. Famed photographer Annie Leibovitz has created some of the most powerful and memorable portraits of our time. From world leaders to entertainers, her work has graced galleries around the world. One of her most popular series of photographs is called Women, and it was first published more than 15 years ago. She has now updated it with pictures reflecting the changes in the roles of women today. The exhibition is called Women, New Portraits, and it's nearing the end of a global tour. Annie Leibowitz is this week's Urban Voice. It's an exhibit that seeks to present an honest reflection of women in society today. There is not enough imagery of women in art that show us as whole human beings. Men have been portrayed for a long time. Women need to be visualized. Imagery of women has to catch up. Celebrated portrait photographer Annie Leibovitz has made it her life's work to catch up and get the balance right. To support female entrepreneurs who are building businesses. Women began as a project from 1999 that I did with Susan Sontag. It was Susan Sontag's idea. And I was reluctant. Uh, I was concerned that the subject is as a subject as big and as broad as women was it was just too big it was like going out and photographing the sea or photographing the ocean but the idea was to show what women look like now what roles they play in retrospect looking back it turns out out of all my projects to be the one that still that still resonates and has a lot of interest uh, across the board it is not a subject that can be wrapped up. I, I knew I would update it at some time. This year, Annie Leibowitz is presenting her latest exhibition in a traveling pop-up show all around the world. I 
Like in the original work, there are school teachers, minors, uh, homeless women, abused women. They stand on their own. They're as, in, they're as interesting as almost the subject uh, that, they're, that they're going off to do. And at some point, you see them cross over into the empathy of what the situation is. These women are extraordinary. I didn't have to like sit there and figure it out. It was like there were 10 women I immediately wanted to do. I was determined to get Malala for our series and uh, this is actually the end of her school day uh, in her school in Birmingham where, where she was brought after she was almost murdered uh, by the Taliban for the simple reason of wanting girls to have uh, an education, uh, being able to go to school. We have um, Caitlyn Jenner. It's, it's not so simple to say that uh, we are two sexes, you know, it's two genders. You know, I think it's a little more complicated than that. One of the things that I'm very, very uh, conscious of now that was not there in 1999 is the confidence that I'm uh, seeing in women today uh, who are doing their work. When you look at the work up on the wall, um, the women are, are, are democratically placed. You know, everyone is equal size, so to speak. They need each other. The photograph is just like the tip of the iceberg, what you know, these women have, have achieved, and where, where, they've, where they've come from, and where they went through. The exhibit also features a portrait of longtime Leibovitz friend Gloria Steinem. A journalist and an activist world famous for defending women's rights. What Anna has done has blown up and shown us that female human beings are every bit as diverse and unique and yet shared in our humanity as male human beings are. And that is huge. <laughs> we are also full human beings. And the idea of two roles, masculine and feminine, was invented. We can disinvent them. The idea of race was invented. We can disinvent it. Somehow, she shows us each human being in a unique way, and yet, you know it's Annie's eye. I have never figured out how she does that. I'm a father of two kids, right, two uh, uh, girls. I want them to grow up in a world where diversity doesn't play a role anymore. Um, and I think that's what an exhibition like this does. It provokes us to have a conversation. It's important to see who we are, how diverse we are, how confident we can be. The work we are doing, we need to like ourselves. We need more understanding, and we need more work on all the issues. New York City and Zurich are the last two cities hosting the exhibition this year. It made earlier stops in Asia, North America, and Europe. Finally, we head to the Dominican Republic's capital of Santo Domingo. The historic district is called the Colonial City, or Zona Colonial, and it's considered the oldest European settlement of the New World. The old architecture seen in various landmarks, buildings, and cathedrals have withstood the passage of time. We leave you with a look at the historic sites of this UNESCO World Heritage Site. 
Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week for another edition of America's Now. Thank you.